Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, start to introduce you to the players on the landscape, at least of the mammals, because there's a whole variety of them, and there's two issues that need to be addressed. One is why so many different species can coexist, and partly that coexistence comes about because they perceive the landscape differently, and that perception of the landscape being different also leads to different patterns of how they organize themselves socially. We talked about in the lecture on behavioral ecology the issues of cost and benefits in how different species organize themselves differently, but based on cost of living in groups versus the benefits of living groups. And so you guys, we talked about that when I gave my, my, my talk, okay? And so we'll deal with that for you guys as well as for these guys as best I can. So here you see a picture of typical African catena ecosystem. And what do you see? You see on one side to the right of your screen, you see a hill slope and it goes down to a little depression. You see a flat grassland, which could be at the bottom of the slope or at the top of the slope. And then you see a riverine forest, which means that you're seeing an area around standing water. So on the left is going to be a river that mostly has water in it most of the time. And that's why you've got big tall trees there and not a whole lot of grasses. You'll see grasses on the flat open area and you'll see grasses on the hill slope in the sump which is a little depression that you see on the right as well as the steep hill slope and at the apex on the top you'll see over on that area shrubby type vegetation opposed to tall tree type vegetation a lot of this is driven by the availability of moisture which comes in the form of rainfall and it comes also in terms of how much water is retained in the soils Right now in Nepal, it's been pouring, it's flooded, it's muddy, it's full of rain, uh, devastatingly so. Hopefully when we get there, there'll be significantly less water. We won't be able to go anywhere or do anything if these rains, which have been nonstop since September, continue past December, which is when they're supposed to stop. So this is called the Katana ecosystem. There's eight deceitful hills, then there's the hill slope, and then there's the depression, the lugga at the bottom. Water pools in the lugga. You'll see the distribution of species. Some species like Dick Dick, which are all the way on the right, are tiny. They are only a few kilograms in weight. They live in and amongst the brushy trees and they are mixed feeders. They, they eat the grasses as well as some of the new growth of the, um, the leaves on the tree. Other species range more widely, so you can see the buffalo, the next species up on the graph, range all the way from anywhere on the hill slope to all the way into the woodland area. So they are eclectic and can eat anything and move anywhere. The, the rhino is depicted here as the black rhino, and it tends to be a browser, and it lives mostly where there's going to be deciduous leaves on trees. And then you see the impala, which is a mixed feeder. It can live on the grasses and on the browse and tends to range in an ecotone between the two habitats. You'll see all the way on the left is the bush buck, which is restricted then to very moist habitats. Again, a middle body size species. And then next to it, you'll see the water buck, which lives in and amongst the riverine habitat, but comes out to spend the evenings uh, resting and sleeping in the more open areas in the grasslands. If you go above that, you see the species that integrate all habitats. Elin, Grants Gazelle, Congoni, they are a mixture of, of grazers, the Congoni and the Grants Gazelle and the Elin, which are mixed feeders, mostly browse, range across the entire Katana ecosystem from the apex to the, to, the, to the plains. Above them, you'll see the larger bodied species, the topi, the wildebeest, the zebra, which are all grazers and they live in the open plainsy area. Uh, Thompson's gazelle is very closely related to the Grant's gazelle, but it's a grass eater and is very, very specific on what grasses it's going to eat. The giraffe and elephant range widely. The giraffe are browsers and the elephants are mixed feeders. They can browse or graze. You'll see a number of issues here. One, they don't all live in the same habitat, but there is much overlap in the habitats they seem to use. 
Number two, they differ largely in body size. And as we'll see, the difference in body size will affect the ranging ability, the cost of transport, as well as the types of vegetation that they're going to eat. So if there's so coexistence of so many species, that means there are many niches. Why are there so many niches? Why do these different species perceive a common landscape as being divisible into different ways to make a living? Because generally what we think of a niche, it's the type of lifestyle that an organism can, 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 can um, display. There are two, two factors that account for this extraordinary diversity, and one of the factors has to do with an equilibrium view of the landscape, that species will come to populate a landscape in such a way that their numbers will reach some equilibrium in the sense that, which we talked about in the lecture on population biology, they will come to some carrying capacity where crowding will eventually limit their ability to reproduce. And so they'll be in steady state where a mother will have just enough daughters to replace herself in that crowded environment. It presupposes, though, that species will come to this equilibrium or carrying capacity condition. The other is that view that the ecosystem is a non-equilibrium system, that the fluctuations in the environment are so extreme that species never reach their carrying capacity. They're always rebounding from environmental harshness, which knocks their numbers down, and they grow exponentially to fill the niche. Um, and therefore, many species coexist because there is no competition, there is no crowding. But let's first look at the equilibrium perspective. Species are going to be differ with respect to two main functions, the body size and fermentation system. Body size, as we'll see, will set constraints on the type of food, that, the amount of food that individuals can eat. The fermentation system will do the same thing. If you're a herbivore, one thing you have to understand is most of the nutrients and most of the energy are locked in parts of the plant that you can't digest. Digestion requires enzymes to lock on to proteins and to sugars to be able to break them down. If they're locked in woody materials, then animals can't handle them unless they have microbes that can ferment this woody material and break it down to goodies that can then be digested and absorbed in the intestine. To have these microbes, animals have to provide homes for these microbes. And they can put the home either before the stomach in a foregut, which is called a rumen, or they can put the home for these microbes in something, in an organ that is behind the stomach before the intestine, which is called, called, called a cecum. The cecum in us is our appendix. It's, it's um, an organ that no longer functions, but it's still there physically. Either of these places can be where microbes exist. The microbes do their job of breaking down these um, plant materials so that the goodies can be absorbed and used for protein and for energy. Okay, this leads to this differentiation and it leads to grazing succession or facilitation, which we'll talk about in a moment. Habitats, I did say the second, that they're not in equilibrium, they change, and it's that density independence that allows for many species to use the landscape differently to coexist without butting heads over competition. So let's look at body size and its impact on why there's so many niches and why there's so many different societies. So here is the famous mouse to elephant curve. You'll see on the left, the y-axis is metabolic rate, and we usually measure that using isotopes, uh, doubly labeled water, to use isotopes to measure the inputs and the outputs of, of oxygen. Or we can strap a mask onto an animal and measure its ventilation rate. Um, the amount of oxygen that it's using as it stands still or as it's on a treadmill. On the x-axis, body size, and in this graph, we have a log-log plot. We plot the logarithm of body size versus the logarithm of metabolic rate, and we get a straight line. Had we not plotted the logarithm of these variables, you tend to get a line that looks like this. It goes up, but it shows reaching a plateau, hitting diminishing returns. And so, as a consequence, we straighten this out by using log-log plots. Our eyes are good at looking at log-log plots. They're, we can look at parallel lines, but it also allows us very easily and, 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 and rigorously to measure the slope of the line. So what you see in this plot is that as animals get bigger, they have higher metabolic rates. Mouse 
I'm now Dan, Dan, Dan one, one interjection Bye. here. So, because uh, we talked a lot about statistical fit, uh, fitting and whatever, so, and, and, and other things. So, fitting on a log log, fitting a line on a log log uh, scale is very different than fitting and data, a, 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 an exponential line to an actual data, exponential function to an actual original non transformed data. Because, right, right so just uh, uh, this is an, as, as an aside, you cannot measure. Uh, in goodness of fit in the same way, and and your sum of distances. So, for example, correlations. You cannot compare correlation two two lines in the same way, uh, because uh, when we talk about networks, there are lots of uh, log log plots, but they are just mostly for visualization. You have to deal with them differently when you want to do statistical analysis on them. Yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, you can do statistics on any number. The statistics doesn't care about the number. It's just that as you decompose it and take the anti-log, your variances are going to be very different. They'll be asymmetrical around the mean. But the, the statistics will be done on those particular numbers. But when you, the, the problem, right, it, it, you have to be aware that it's done on the log. And when you do log transformations, for okay. example, products become, become uh, summations, right? Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. So you, you need to understand what you've done to the data, but the point is that you get, you, on a log log plot, you're getting significantly tighter fits, and the reason is is because you're taking the big numbers and making them small, and you're changing your error distribution. Right. The point of the, using the log log plots is we often want to make comparisons among taxa and among groups, and having straight lines allows for an easier visualization of the trends and whether or not you can use the same slopes to describe your general rules or whether the differences are just much more fundamental because the lines themselves are not parallel. Right. Be that as it may, you get a mouse to elephant curve here, which shows you that elephants require more food per day to sustain themselves than a mouse does. Okay, and that's a function of body size. But the slope of that line is less than 1. If the slope of that line were 1, it would imply that you have geometric scaling, which means as you double the body size, you double the metabolic rate. If you triple the body size, you triple the metabolic rate. That's called geometric scaling. The fact that the line is less than 1 has profound consequences for understanding the coexistence of species. In fact, the slope of this line is 0.75, which means because on an arithmetic plot you're getting this line coming to a carry to a diminishing returns, it means that sure enough, bigger animals need absolutely more food than smaller animals, but if we were to plot the weight-specific metabolic rate, so that we took this metabolic rate and divided it again by body mass, and took the logarithm of that, and plotted it against the log of the body mass, as shown in the second graph to the right, you see you get a negative relationship with a slope that complements the 0.75, in fact the slope is negative 0.25, as you'd expect by that weight-specific normalization. And what that means is that on a weight-specific basis, the cost of keeping one gram of tissue, or in fact one cell alive, is different for a big-bodied species and a small-bodied species. So although the mouse needs absolutely less food than an elephant to sustain itself per day, on a weight-specific or on a cell-specific basis, the cost to that mouse of keeping one gram of tissue going or one cell alive is higher than the cost of an elephant doing exactly the same thing. And those two factors, when co-joined, suggest that larger species need more food than smaller species, but on a per-gram basis, the metabolism of a large species is smaller than that of a small species. And what that means is large species can subsist on lower quality food, so-called straw, than small species who, because of that higher weight-specific metabolic rate, need to subsist on very high quality food. They need less of it, but each mouthful has to be of high quality. So they need a bigger bang for the calorie than the big-bodied animals such as the elephant. Which means that the same species living on the same landscape need to see the landscape as very, very different. The big body species is looking for large quantities of food and doesn't care much about the quality of any item that it eats. The smaller body species couldn't care less about how much food is out there, 
but it's going to search for those morsels that give it high quality for every bite it takes. So it doesn't need many bites per day, but it needs each bite to be a big bang for its calorie. And so that means that on a landscape, the same distribution of food items as we see it is perceived very differently by each of the players depending on their body size. Now body size also has a number of other factors than just nutrients and energy that the species need. It often opens them up to different levels of risk. Big bodied species are immune except to all, except the largest of predators. Small bodied species can be preyed upon by large bodied predators as well as small bodied predators. So risk also enters into the picture that they see the landscape not only differently from bottom up factors, you'll hear us talk about bottom up factors a lot, which are food and nutrients, energy and, and, and protein, for example, but also top down elements such as predation. <clears throat> so, so big body species see habitats that are open as possibly rich in large amounts of food, but dry and lousy straw-like material, and they don't care so much about protection and hiding out in a habitat because their body size affords them protection. Small-bodied species, on the other hand, will see a habitat that's open and full of brown material that consists of a lot of stems as worthless both in terms of protecting them against predation as well as providing them those big energetic gains, the bang for the calorie. So as a consequence, this species, the little dick dick, you're not going to see out in the open grassland. You're going to see it in habitats like this that are going to be shaded habitats where there's going to be low-lying um, bushes and shrubs that protect the grasses. Okay, and in that sense, by shading them and by allowing water to penetrate by banging off the leaves first and then slowly hitting the ground, increasing your filtration, the vegetation is going to stay green longer and support more growing, highly digestible parts of the plants. Every grass will have leaves, stems, and seed heads. Seed heads will consist of high protein, high fat, high water concentrated elements. The leaves will be growing and photosynthesizing, and as animals eat them, they'll regrow, and they'll push up from the growing parts underground. So leaves are often nubile and green if they're being managed by herbivores. And the stems are pretty awful. The stems are there by the plants to grow tall, to, high, to keep the seeds high, so they can broadcast the seeds far and wide so that the plants can reproduce and sustain themselves. Plants are not necessarily designed to support herbivores. They try to resist being eaten by herbivores. Instead, they're designed to broadcast their seeds and to tiller and spread um, and grow by, by asexual reproduction by making tillers go for new roots and new leaves. And so the herbivores will not be able to subsist if they're small on the stems. They'll prefer to eat the seed heads and also the new leaves that will be nutritious and digestible. So the dick thick is restricted to these shaded habitats where green growing material will grow for longer into the season and where there will be digestible plant parts such as leaves and seeds, leaves and seeds that they can eat. Notice their snouts. Their snouts have points. They're pointy that allows them flexibility to be able to manipulate the plants almost like primates can with their fingers. And so as a consequence, they can get in and about and eat the good green stuff and avoid the brown tougher stuff or avoid the stuff that's got thorns that keep them away. If you go up in body size, you get to the mid-body size species such as the impala. The impala, on the other hand, because of its large body size, larger body size, can subsist on more low quality vegetation. So they can live in the ecotone between the areas that are shaded where there's green growing parts and the grasslands. As long as the grasslands are not completely dried out, they can subsist on the grasslands longer than the dick dicks can. So they can oscillate back and forth between grasslands and shaded areas. They can move up and down the apex of the cantena, moving from the areas where there's fewer shrubs shading to where there are shrubs shading. And a larger body size lets them do this because they can subsist on plant parts that are of lower quality. So they're not necessarily restricted to eating the few green morsels that may not be evenly distributed and abundant on the landscape. So their large body size allows them to do that. 
Similarly, the water buck can subsist on the lower quality vegetation. And you can see here, it's in a mixed area where there are a lot of leaves under the trees and forbs that it can live on, but it also has the green grass and it's got some stem um, that they will not necessarily shun. You go up to the zebras, we start to see species that are hindgut fermenters and large body size. And so they can subsist both on the lowest quality food available and they can then spend most of the time out on the open savannas where the vegetation is going to dry out and lose its nutrient richness and become harder to digest. If you go up in body size even further to the cave buffalo, they can roam even more widely than the, than the zebras and they can subsist on some of the lowest quality vegetation. But what separates the zebra from the wildebeest or the cave buffalo in this case is the zebras are high gut fermenters. And what that means is they place their fermentation system behind the stomach after digestion has taken place which means they're sacrificing, again, quality for quantity. If you put your fermentation chamber before your stomach, you, you have the benefit of having the microbes do their job before you pass all of that into the stomach where hydrochloric acid and enzymes can do the digesting. That stew then gets passed into the intestine where, where it's easy to absorb all the goodies both of digestion and of fermentation. But the problem is that you need high quality food to do that because the lower the quality of food that you stick in that rumen, the longer it takes the microbes to do their job of breaking it down. And so we do have cases of animals with full rumens starving to death because during drought periods they are stuck having to eat the most tough lignified material. And the microbes are doing the best they can, but they can't process the food quick enough for a large body fermentation, rumen fermenting species to get enough food into the gut to digest, to get enough food into the intestine to be absorbed to keep the animal alive. And so buffalo often die during drought because although they're big body size and they can subsist on low quality food, they do need some high quality food and a large amount of it because of their body size to be able to ferment it fast enough to get it into the stomach into the intestines to live. And so during drought, when they are stuck, and even the swamps and the marshes that they live on become um, full of tough vegetation because the water evaporates, that's when they perish. If you go up to even bigger species like the elephant, they have a sacculated stomach before the, before the stomach, so it's not a complete rumen. They're less structured, and they're given their body size. They can subsist on anything they want, whenever they want. Plus, they can bulldoze, bulldoze down trees and tear off the meristem and live on the cambium, the growing parts of trees, um, when the going gets tough. Okay? So you can now see why there's the coexistence of so many species and why there are so many niches that you start going up in body size and you start seeing species that can live on the tougher stuff on the open grasslands. And you can look at this picture now and start to see that your bush buck and your dick dick, your two smaller species, are restricted to the more mesic or wetter areas and your bigger species are the species that can go out onto the grasslands and live on the tougher, more lignified material um, that are harder to digest and harder to ferment. Your biggest species that are hindgut fermenters can have the best of both worlds. It doesn't mean they can't live on high quality food. It just means they won't pass it up if they can get it, but they can when, when the going gets tough during dry periods, especially droughts, they can make a go of it on the toughest habitats. So that's partly what body size will do. Fermentation, as we saw, the zebras are the only hindgut fermenter in this picture, and the rhinoceros. They're the ones for their body size that can live on the coarsest vegetation because a hindgut fermenter doesn't have that bottleneck. But that means they have to eat twice as much food as an equivalent body sized ruminant because what they can pass through very quickly, there's no constraint, means they have to double the amount of food that they can eat. But if there's lots of tough straw out there, they can just find twice as much food and be happy clams.
living on that landscape. Okay, so that accounts for how body size and fermentation system allows different species to use the same landscape and coexist without, without butting heads on competition. You guys got that over there in UIC? Now we'll visit the same species mix again, but this time we'll look at sociality. And here on the left is a framework for thinking about how animal social systems develop. All animals have to worry about bottom-up factors of acquiring food. All animals have to worry about top-down factors in terms of predators eating them and providing safe sites for their youngsters that are even more vulnerable. Now we return to some basic evolutionary biology. There's issues of natural selection and issues of sexual selection. Natural selection are how animals solve problems posed by nature. And so they're generally these problems of avoiding predators and acquiring foodstuffs. The second type of selection is called sexual selection, in which we talk about how animals try to gain disproportionate number of matings. In both cases, you're spreading your genes into future generations and behaviors that allow animals to outcompete others and disproportionately spread their genes into future generations are going to be the traits that we see in future generations because either natural selection favors those traits or sexual selection favors those traits. As I said, natural selection is about survival, about acquiring food and having lots of babies, high fecundity, as well as long, long, longevity. There's usually a trade-off, however, as we talked about in the lecture on, on population dynamics and behavioral ecology, that species that live a long time, case-selected species, and not to invest in high levels of fertility, they're investing in long-term survival. And other species, the are selected species, tend to be selected for traits that are high turnaround in, in, in longevity and invest in big bang strategies of lots of, lots of offspring. Sexual selection, on the other hand, is selecting for traits that might lead to um, lower benefits in terms of survival, but have trade-offs for increasing disproportionate access to mates. In general, it's males that compete amongst themselves to disproportionately acquire matings with females, or males display and exhibit traits that impress females that they either have good genes or the males, despite handicaps, can survive and therefore attract the attention of females. Either way, males may incur costs in terms of diminished survival, but they increase their likelihood of passing on genes into future generations by disproportionately gaining access to a large number of females. In general, females are under more intense natural selection than males are. Males need to maintain a, a body size that lets them survive and be in good enough condition to be able to resist predators and to impress females. But females tend to outcompete other females and leave a disproportionate number of offspring if they can acquire more food than other females and if they can avoid being eaten by other females by other, by, better than other females, or they can find safe sites that other females can't. And that's how female differential reproduction is proliferated in populations. Males, on the other hand, will gain disproportionate matings by competing with other males or by impressing females to mate with them. So in this diagram, you can see that there are problems posed by nature, food, predators, and safe sites, that represent natural selection and action, and females are tied directly to solving those problems. And so females that solve those problems better than other females will pass more genes on to future generations, and the offspring will display those traits in solving those particular problems. Now what's important to understand is that not all habitats offer the same abundance and distribution of food sources, abundance and distribution of safe sites, or abundance and distribution of predators. Um, and so the best response by females to meeting and solving these needs posed by nature are going to vary depending on the distribution abundance of these selective forces in the environment. Males, on the other hand, are tied to what females do. If females are widely scattered, males are stuck being monogamous because they can't disproportionately gain access to other females. 
If females are clustered, however, then males might show different types of polygyny, which means males will have many gynes or many females to make them. And so this model shows that linkage. And so the best response by females limits and trains the best response by males. And then once males tip their hand, females can respond to, to, to male distributions. And you go around in a circle. So you see that little feedback loop of male dispersion leading to female, female dispersion leading to male dispersion. But then that feeds back on female dispersion, which feeds back on male dispersion. And you get a game theoretic response to the initial distribution that females provide to males. So the actual pattern you see depends on a series of internal constraints. Size we've already seen for exactly the same reason, that females will perceive the habitat as different in its perception of evenness or the dispersedness of the food based on their body size. Big body animals will see the food as more homogeneously and evenly distributed than small body size species, which will see them as discrete, isolated patches, and that will affect their ability to share or not share. Body size also, as we talked about in the lecture on, on behavioral ecology, changes your best response to predators. When you're small, crypsis, hiding, not calling attention to yourself, is important. As you become big, you give away your hiding ability, and so the best defense is to amortize the cost by living in groups, by sharing out that risk and diluting out that risk by living in groups. So body size changes your perception of how best to go about feeding. It also changes your ability to use others to, to reduce the risks of predation. So females of different body sizes are not necessarily going to see the landscape in the same way, leading to the same type of female-female interaction or female-male interaction. External constraints also matter. The absolute abundance and distribution of food is going to change whether there's going to be intense competition amongst the females or not. So if the females are not feeling much competition, then the resource is permissive and it will allow them to aggregate and form groups. Once they form groups, then the best response by males is going to be very different than if females are scattered and males have to treat each female as an isolated resource as opposed to a group being a collection of potentially many resources for mating opportunities. So there's going to be a balance between internal constraints seeing how animals use the landscape and external constraints that's going to affect the abundance and distribution of food resources. So the dick dick we've seen is going to be small body size and it's going to be isolate it's going to require these isolated food items on the landscape. And what do you think the social system is going to be? It's going to be monogamy because the males and the females are going to compete because those resources, especially during dry times, are going to, to force them to be separate. Certainly individual females are not going to want to share the resources with other individual females, and males are not going to want to share the, re share the resources <coughs> with other males. But it takes two to tango in order to breed, and so males and females will tolerate each other, even though they inflict costs on each other, by coming together to form an all-purpose territory, a feeding territory, where one male and one female will share it, Males will drive other males away, and females will drive other females away. Which means the male's going to go, damn, if the female hadn't driven other females away, maybe I could mate polygamously or polygynously because I could have multiple females. But because females are keeping other females away, the males are stuck by being monogamous. As we go up in body size, we saw the impala could live in groups because there's less competition because they can share the lower quality resources with each other without inflicting many costs of sharing. And because they're too big to hide out and be cryptic, they come together in groups anyway to dilute out the risk of predation and to have many eyes detecting predators at a greater distance. Once this happens, males then start to be able to anticipate where females are going to go and you can see there's a dotted line from food to male dispersion. Males anticipate where females are going to prefer to go in greener, better areas when there are 
patchy distributions of resources because these impala are not the largest body species. That means that they can eat anything. They still prefer higher quality food over lower quality food, but they're not necessarily constrained to the highest quality morsels. Males behave as if they can anticipate where females are going to go, and males will fight amongst themselves to set up territories where females are going to be. So you get polygyny, but you get a very special type of polygyny. You get reef source defense polygyny, where the males preemptively stake out territories on the landscape, keep other males away, and then females aggregate and come into his space, and they linger for a certain length of time, depending on the quality of the resources that he can defend. So the best males will defend the best resources. They will attract the most females who will linger there the longest, and guess what? If that happens, there's a greater probability of more females coming to feed on his territory than on another territory. So the males with the best territories are more likely to sire the most offspring because they'll have the most mating opportunities. If you look at the picture of the dictics, you'll also see that around the eyes of the dictics are these black patches. Those patches represent areas where the males can stick the, the stems after they've eaten off the seed heads into a gland that then brings out a black goo which gives an odor laden blob to stick on the top of the stem. And that's the way the dictics communicate silently by olfaction. Because if they actually made noises, they would call attention to the to predators and reduce the chances that crypsis is going to allow them to hide out and avoid being detected by predators. They also, by putting the, the blobs on stems that they've just removed the highest quality food items from, basically are sending a signal to other competitors that are passing through, females to females and males to males, like, don't come to this area. You see there are no seed heads left. I've eaten them. It's not a very good territory. And oh, by the way, here's my odor to prove that I'm still here. Because the odors will decay in time, and if it's a strong odor, it shows that the males are actively using the areas, or females are actively using areas. When you move up to Impala, they're already living in groups, they use much less chemical communication, and they snort and bark at each other as a way for defense, because crypsis and hiding out and avoiding detection is not that common any longer. Instead, they, they're willing to use long-distance communication. So you start to see that the social system changes and the behaviors used to defend and advertise are very different in the middle body size species as opposed to the small body size species, where predation by everything is much more risky than the bigger bodied species that are too big for certain predators and can dilute out the risk by living in groups. By the time you get up to the big buffalo, for example, all food is edible, and if there's enough food, as, a, as when it is usually the case when it's not a drought, the buffalo can go anywhere. And you can do a thought experiment now, that if the buffalo males set up territories, and these big animals don't compete, so they're in the tens, hundreds, or thousands, if males set up territories and have hundreds of females in those territories, that would mean that hundreds of males displaced that would be putting pressure on those males. And then the defense of that physical area would be great because the area would be, have to be huge to encompass all the different types of foods that are needed as the seasons change and the good areas change. So instead, these animals wander and males, instead of setting up territories to attract females and keep other males out, tend to use their, their dominance to protect an individual female. And they consort with those females while she's in estrus, mate with her, stay with her just long enough so she comes out of estrus, and then goes find the next female in estrus. And the bigger, bossy guys displace the wussy, smaller guys, and they're polygynous. They mate multiple times, but not by defending an area and mating with all the females in the area. They use their dominance to bully males, and they mate sequentially, first with one female, then another female, then another female, then another female. And so the type of polygyny they have is not resource defense polygyny, but instead they have what we call a dominance-based polygyny, where they use their dominance to form court consort ships with individual females. They move one from the other to the other to the other. And you can see that that change in the type of polygyny, the still selection for, sexual selection for males to mate many times, is driven by the change in the risk of predation and driven by their ability to see the landscape as more homogeneous 
And so females can come together in large groups to protect themselves against predators. So you can see that body size has, has had an effect on where animals distribute themselves, but it's also had an effect on sociality. <coughs> what about equids, the zebras that we study? Here you've got two very different societies of zebras. One is open membership, <coughs> fish infusion societies, which is the Grevy zebra, where the males, again, have a resource defense polygyny. They stake out territories and females wander amongst the territories. And then you've got the plain zebra, which live in harem groups, closed membership groups, where females associate with one male for a long period of time, sometimes for their entire life, and they then are loyal to that male. And that leads to a harem defense polygyny, which is very rare in the mammalian world. Harem defense polygyny is shown by some bats and by zebras and by some um, pinnipeds, but largely most of the polygynous mating systems of mammals, especially herbivorous mammals, are either resource defense polygyny or um, dominance defense polygyny. Why is it that plain zebras live in harems and grevy zebras don't? The reason is, is that males provide material benefits. By virtue of their large body size and their high gut fermentation system, they can feed on anything. The only thing that restricts how much food a female can get is the amount of time she has to feed. And so males, by being vigilant, protect their females from the intrusions of other males and so females can gain up to six minutes more per time feeding. So when we look at percent time grazing as a function of group size in the plain zebras, there is no negative decline with, um, with group size as a uh, percent grazing as a function of group size. Here you get no statistically significant relationship that females in large groups feed as well as females in small groups. And the reason for this is the males act as the social shock absorber on the system. They absorb the cost of defense of keeping harassing males away. And so females are highly choosy, choosing to be with males that are good defenders because by being good defenders, they give them more time to graze. The consequence of this is that males don't hurt their females as much. They keep other males away. And you can see then females that bond with high-ranking males are distressed significantly less than females with low-ranking males. And the consequence of this is that when we count the number of surviving offspring to the age of independence, that's when the females no longer nurse their young, then you can see that females that get it right and go with high-quality males tend to out-reproduce females that for one reason or another can't get into those groups with the high-quality males. And so females are really choosy because the males are providing material rewards. And that's why females move around until they get it right, and then they bond to those males, and as long as those males remain dominant and remain able to keep other males away, the males gain high loyalty of those females, gain high reproductive success by mating with those females and having high paternity, and those females get higher body condition so they can lactate more effectively, and as a consequence, out-reproduce females that for whatever reason can't bond to high quality males. This applies to mountain zebras and horses, which we won't see out in Africa, but are distributed worldwide. Why don't grevy zebras form harems? And this leads us to the last critically important case, is that the different classes of females, those that have babies and need to lactate and need high protein and water, in plain zebras can coexist with females that do not need um, to, to drink as much because food and water are close together. They live in a mesic landscape where there's abundant water distributed among the various types of feeding patches of high and low quality. In the Grevy zebra, they live in more arid landscapes where food and water are more widely scattered. And as a consequence, because of their bigger body size, not every female has to drink every day like the plain zebra. And so females that don't need to drink every day that want to fatten up so they can give birth again more quickly go out and seek high quality food whereas the females that need to drink every day pay a price in terms of sacrificing good feeding in order to maximize drinking. And as a consequence, they stay near water. And that leads to um, females and males um, seeing differently on, on what's good. Because here on the right is a graph of the expected distribution of a random point. What we can do is we can drop random points 
on the landscape. And as the season dries out, we can see what the distance is to the nearest random point, that from each random point to the nearest um, drinking source. And you can see the dotted line increases, the distance to water increases as the environment dries out, as you go from early dry season to late dry season. You can see that non-lactating females, those that are searching for high quality food, basically are distributed on a landscape no different from random points in terms of distance from water. But those with young foals, as shown on the left, foals less than three months of age, they are distributed much closer to water than, than random points are. They basically never get more than a half a kilometer away from water. Given that both females need different foods and have different needs for water, that tears the social fabric which means that um, females that have different needs don't stay together, and as a consequence, males need access to both females, so the dominant males set up territories on routes to water so that those that need to drink every day stay inside their territories, whereas those that need to go find food oscillate from drinking every three to five days, go out to feed and come back, and those males intercept those females, so the dominant males have access to both classes of females because both classes are equally valuable in terms of fertility. The lower ranking males only set up territories on the feeding areas. They cannot gain access to females that have the postpartum estrus. They only have access to females that, um, that spend time out in the grazing area. So they're polygynous, but they're not going to be as polygynously successful as the dominant males that have access to both classes of females. Now, this social system from a female perspective is very different from the harem system. The harem system is monoandrous because every female is loyal to one male. She mates with one male, so she only mates with one male, monoandry. These females that wander among male territories are polyandrous. They mate with many males, and so males try to inflict movement constraints on females by biting them on the withers and turning them back so that they come out of heat before they mate with the next male. They also have disproportionately large testes for their body weight, so the sperm competition that goes on inside the females because they mate multiply, so that males that are dominant mate more times with the females while they linger on their territory, hence displacing the sperm of other males, increasing the likelihood that inside the female, their sperm will be the sperm that mates with the females. And so you can start to see, again, how body size, fermentation system lead to differences on landscapes that are arid or mesic in terms of social systems, even in the zebras that are so close to related. We also know that zebras form herds, that plain zebras, the harems come together and form herds that are themselves fusion, and the usual suspects as we search for selective forces that are going to affect this are predation, bottom-up factors of food, or socio-sexual forces, again, from reproductive competition. Our data shows that predation, surprisingly, has no impact on whether herds form or not, because presumably, once, once harems get as large as 10 individuals, the proportion of risk of predation is already small, so being in, with 20 or 30 individuals doesn't give you, on a per capita basis, much of an advantage. But predation does affect where zebras go. So zebras avoid areas where predation is intense. So you've got this movement on the landscape of a shell game as zebras avoid areas where predators are. So predation sets the stage for groups to form. And you can see that zebra density goes down where predator intensity is high based on our predation index. But there are areas where zebra density is high. And in high density areas, you're going to potentially get some large groups. We know that food does make a difference in terms of quantity, but not quality, We're using principal component analysis to separate out the various measures we make, uh, gather on vegetation, which we might do when we're out there in, in our course, and we can divide the data into the principal components analysis, shows us there's a quantity axis, a quality axis, and a species diversity axis. Only the quantity axis, axis is correlated with herd, herd size, so that the more abundant the food, the larger the herds. Not surprisingly, this makes sense for a hindgut fermenting species. But the most important factor on herd size is the number of bachelor males, or the bachelor stallion ratio. So where cuck holding pressure, where there are lots of males trying to steal copulations, that's where herds form, so that the number of stallions can band together and form coalitions. This is where networks are going to become important. 
because those coalitions are going to be relatively more or less effective depending on their size and their cohesion in terms of keeping bachelor males away. And if bachelor males are kept away, female foraging success goes up just like it did with the core groups. And so decision making by females and males is very much an interactive venture that if you do this cartoon, low to high grazing rate on the y-axis and number of harems from solitary to two or more on the, on the x-axis, solitary harems is where grazing rate is the highest because there's no competition from other groups and very little competition among individuals inside any harem. As multiple harems form on the landscape, you don't have much of a depression in feeding because the groups themselves can spread out because of their large body size, they can avoid competition, and because of their large body size and high fermentation, they can subsist on anything. On the other hand, if a solitary group is found by bachelor males, both the stallions and the females suffer because the male can't keep the bachelors away, and they come and they harass the male and they harass the females, so foraging goes down. Females in their right mind should leave these males as wusses and say, forget it. On the other hand, if the harems form aggregations, then it acts as an insurance policy because whether or not bachelors exist, the males are already in coalitions to protect the females and their own foraging from the presence and the actions of the bachelors. So you can see that in anticipation of high risk of, of bachelors, males should form groups form herds in order to amortize the costs of joining the groups and forming these, these insurance patterns. What do we actually see? We actually see on our ranches in Lycipia where we work that there are different bachelor stallion ratios based on different hunting strategies by humans. So on Seguera Ranch where the owner, when he was still alive, would go out and singly shoot individual bachelor males, he would lower the bachelor to stallion ratio, lower the cuckolding pressure, lower the risk of a harem being detected by bachelors because there are just fewer bachelors on the landscape. On, I'm sorry, that's on El Karama Ranch. So the bachelor to stallion ratio is less than one. On Seguera, they go out with AK-47s and they shoot the entire family groups because they need a lot of meat to feed to their dogs and to give to another neighboring ranch to feed his menagerie of animals. And there you can see by shooting mostly stallions, family groups, the bachelor stallion ratio goes up because there aren't as many stallions to reduce the intruder pressure on the females. Therefore, you'd expect on Seguera, where the bachelor stallion ratio is higher, there'd be more pressure for harems to aggregate and form herds, and you see herd size is statistically significantly larger than El Karama, where by reducing the intruder pressure, by shooting bachelors, there's less pressure on females to pay whatever small cost there are to form aggregations of herds. And so you see the harem, the herd size is slightly smaller. So here's an experimental test by allowing hunting to test our hypotheses about the functions of multiple males in leading to groups forming. Okay? I was just wondering, since you talked about this in class, whether there might be some issue of group forming as a response to perceived predation with hunting pressure. Perceived hunting pressure? hunted, perhaps they might want you know, predator avoidance. The trouble is hunting against AK-47s is not going to help because by being in a large group, there's two factors with predation. One is the trade-off between lowering per capita risk, assuming that detectability doesn't increase the likelihood that you're going to have more attackers on your larger group. And so larger groups are going to attract people in cars, they're going to open with their AK-47s. So do you think the zebras are privy to that, that when it comes to humans, Absolutely, yeah. I That's think awesome. zebras are pretty smart. They're going, to, they're going to know that cars that come on certain ranches are going to shoot them. And that's why, one of, that's why in conservation, just as an aside, um, when we talk about multiple land use and people say, oh, we can do everything. We can do some hunting for the poor people and we can do tourism for the rich people. The problem is that any surviving zebra that's been in a population that's been hunted changes its detection distance and therefore starts to respond to all cars as negative, which of course is going to lower the ecotourist potential because you lose that situation. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's not so much the structure of the habitat as the presence or actions of active hunting. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole thing on ecology of fear, which Joel Brown at, at Chicago, Illinois, um, has done a lot of work on, which is that animals will change the balance in which they seek protection and forego foraging, depending on the degree and the intensity of predation. Now, did Joel talk to these guys early on, or did they just talk to you guys? Uh, partially, because uh, Joel, part of the people here have uh, heard Joel in the computational biology class last semester that I, last semester that I taught, yeah. So about half, I think, uh, okay, so have, and, and Carrie so and Joel, of course, have heard Joel's talk. He didn't talk to Mark. I can give you some papers, but you can right. imagine well, he, what happened. Well, he'd be also more than happy to come and talk if that's... <laughs> Well, we don't have a lot of time, but, right? But, yeah, that's the problem. So I think it, it's, it's likely to happen uh, in spring that he'll talk, but not before we go there, yeah. Right, okay, so we, I can give you some of the things. But the logic is really simple, is that you try to find a way to measure how animals titrate risk. And so you can, if you can, if you can which we can't do with our species, move these feeding trays away from danger, you find, away from protected, from wood, wooded areas, if, if wood is protection, what you find is that they tend to leave more food in the tray, the more the tray goes into risky areas. So, so they're not, well, I'm sorry? Yeah, so I know, I don't know the details, but I know Joel has done some experiments on zebras in South Africa with uh, giving up density uh, and mapping. Yeah, yeah but, but it's not, it's, it's, yeah, he has, but it's it's it, the problem is it works better for animals that eat discrete crude items. Okay. Right. Then yeah, but I know he's de he's developed one of his PhD students has developed something. I don't again. I don't know the details of what what exactly. It is, yeah, zebras don't zebras don't like to eat artificial food. That's the they can't measure. <laughs> yeah, but in ge well. in general, he he works. You have to measure. You have to measure before and after in order to see yeah. what they've left. Right, but I mean, couldn't you do just sort of like a mass thing? So yeah, you leave, I don't know, two kilograms of food. But they won't eat it. They, they, the zebras won't eat anything. Well, I thought it would go up to the discrete if they had sort of three particles of food. <laughs> zebras won't eat it. They'll just sniff it and walk by it. Okay, so you can do it with dick dicks. You can feed them particles, you know, grab a chow, and they will, they will nibble it, which is a project we might want to do or something like that. But you can move this in and out. And when you put predators onto the landscape, everything changes. So whatever the normal pattern is, the, the shape of the curve for the ecology of fear, when you have active predation, it shifts it even more inward, that they start to adjust and they don't come out. And this, this has been shown as they put wolves back in Yellowstone, all of a sudden they no longer come out and use the open habitats, they live in the forest, they've mucked up the forest by trampling it in the wet season, they've lost biodiversity. All those things have changed. Sorry? Yeah, they, they change it in some cases, right? So a lot, a lot of things are going on depending on whether you have these predators there or not. Okay. Okay. But the last thing I want to talk about is how these species affect each other. So the rumens are more efficient than the cecums, but the rumens require high, high quality food. So we saw that cecum fermenters consist on low quality vegetation. And what you tend to get is a grazing succession. So this is from the diorama at the American Museum of Natural History. And it is the classic antenna ecosystem. And you see the plains below, the hill slope coming up to the apex. And our three players are the zebras, which we now know about, are the largest body size species in the triple. Of, of zebras, wildebeest, and gazelles. They are not only big, but they're high gut fermenters. Number two player is the wildebeest. They're big, but they're four gut fermenters. And number three are the Grant's gazelle, which are smaller and, high, and four gut fermenters. So if you have to rank them in their ability to subsist on low quality food, the zebras can do that better than the wildebeest, who can do that better from the Grant's gazelle. And so what you tend to get is movement down the catena that when it's raining, everybody's up on the katana because they can see and they can avoid predators, but as soon as it stops raining, the grass starts to get cropped down, and the big body size species can't survive, they have a big mouth, so they can't be very selective, and so they are the ones that have to leave first. They go down to the dangerous areas that have been growing, the sumps in the luggage where the grass has been growing, where it sets seed, and everybody, the plants are really happy because no one's been eating it, Lions are hanging out there because they're concealed by the tall grass. 
The zebras are cannon fodder, they get eaten, but they eat down the vegetation. Meanwhile, the wildebeest who have um, the, 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 um, the a smaller mouth, they can subsist a little bit longer up on the apex. If they had gone down first into the sump where it was all straw, they would perish. But fortunately, by the time they've driven off the apex down to the sump, the zebras have done their magic. They've eaten all the straw. They've eaten all the stems. They've gotten eaten by the lions. Sunlight gets in to the lugga, which has more moisture, so new growing grass starts to happen. The wildebeest are happy campers. They eat the new growing stuff. They then eat more of that down, and the gazelles with the pointy mouths that don't need much food, who could subsist on the apex longer than the others, finally are forced off. They go down last, and by the time they get down there, it's almost like the Garden of Eden. The moisture in the soil has allowed the vegetation to keep growing, and so they see a landscape that is, is already cropped. There's not that much predation. Lots of good bottom-up vegetation for them to eat, and so they are happy campers. And so each species facilitates the other in the sense that the zebras are forced off first. They transform the habitat. The wildebeest then can survive. The wildebeest further transform the habitat so that the Grenz gazelles can survive. Again, it's showing you that the differences in body size and fermentation system lead to differences in movement ecology, diet, and we've now seen social behavior as well. So you start to see there's some commonalities about multiple ways in which they can coexist on the landscape, both from an equilibrium effect a non-equilibrium effect, as you see here with the grazing succession, and also from a social effect because of the different grouping patterns and the different mating systems. Okay? Tanya, that covers it. Great. Um, well, um, I'm actually going to switch gears. I'm going to take a four-minute break. <laughs> Okay, I mean, I can, I, can, I can now talk a little bit about the sociality stuff that you and I have been doing. And um, we, can, yeah. we can sort of do it jointly if you want. Great, okay. But I gotta go find the talk, and so I gotta do that. So give me a, a minute. So Tanya, have you used this graph before? Yeah. Have we talked about it to your group? Uh, not to the group, no. I mean, they, like Chant knows, of course. Ah. Has, has seen yeah, this yeah. Graph, but no, not, not the rest of it. You guys haven't seen this before. Up with the dynamic part of it. Right, so I'll lead into that. I have a bunch of slides and you can talk to them, okay? Okay. Talk to you. Can I also connect so we can see the side? Possible to put laptops with here or something so we can see the. We had it bigger before, but I don't know how we did it. I'm sorry? It might not be feasible or not, but if, if the slides could just help to the group, you could all just have them right here. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's good. Yeah, I don't, I'd rather not right now, okay? Is your groups ready to go, or did we take a bathroom break? I think some of ours did. Yeah, we lost that. We we need a couple of minutes because I have to figure we have to figure out if if we want to do laptops side by side yours and mine then um, that, then we need a minute. Okay. Right. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Lance, can we do my laptop? Is sure. uh, like both of them, both that laptop and my laptop. You can, but you can only see one at a time. That's fine. Okay, so what about that they see her? They already see her. Mm -hmm. That's what the green button does. And so then when she's done, she's mm -hmm. press the green button. I know. I'm going to get to that. Tanya? Yeah? Tanya, I have all of that, okay? Oh. I'm going to get to that. Okay. I, I, have all, I have all those slides on my talk. So so between the two of us, we'll go with the tag team, okay? Okay, so so then we, we should get the dance slide. Yeah. yeah, use my slides, okay? I don't, have, I don't have to get that back. The, uh, we, we're controlling it. <laughs> oh, you're controlling it? Okay. Put my slides back up and we can, we can, we can do it. He's, he was pushing his slides. Yeah. So you should, you guys should push the slides from your side. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, let me see if I can bring my slides back up. Did I? No. What happened? I mean, I was on before. He said, just push the blue button. Yeah. Push the green button? Green. Oh, yes. oh, there you go. Okay. All right. So this, this is a associate graph, or a network graph of the two species we just, we just with one species we talked about, the Grevy zebra. Okay, that's on the left. Onager is an, is a more arid adapted species of equid. There are wild asses in two places in the world. Their phylogenies are a little bit different. There's the African wild ass, Equus africanus, which lives just north of where the Grevy zebra live in Ethiopia. And they stretch into the more deserty area. And then there's Equus hemionis, which is the Asiatic wild ass, which spans all the way from Israel through Iran, through India, all the way into Mongolia and China. And it goes by different names, such as Onager and Hulan. But they're all the same species. Okay? What's interesting is they're both the same social system, this fission-fusion society, where males defend territories and females wander through. Females with young foals stay in the territories near and around water. And females that don't have young foals are in search of food, which is more sparse and more patchily distributed in the asses than it is in the Grevy zebra. The other thing to know about the asses is that they tend to live in habitats today where there are, there, where there are no predators. And they're often in areas where humans have herds and humans tend to improve the water points to reduce the uncertainty about the availability of water because they're worried about their herds. 
So they're living on landscapes where the food is probably more patchy, but more predictable around oases, and where water has become more predictable because people have changed its abundance. When we look at this graph here, these, these were chosen specifically because they're equal size. Look what happened. They're equal size. Yeah. Did you go to sleep? I think it, it just made my computer went to sleep. So let me see if I can bring it yeah. back. I don't know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming back. Okay. Okay. So so this is this is this is a, a short window in time where there were 28 onagers in the population and a population of 28 gravy zebra and 29 onagers. And we deliberately chose that so the population size would be the same. Tanya, you want to talk a little bit about consequences in networks where you have wildly different sizes of yeah. the size collections of, of particles or individuals that are in networks? Right. So uh, I'm, I'm actually going to back up a little bit because I don't know uh, the different levels about, of, of, of background about in terms of network analysis in general. Um, and maybe a little bit of terminology. Can I switch to my laptop then for a second? Just, just so we have the terminology st together the same way. Well, my next slide, my next slide has all the terminology I oh. think you need. Sorry. She's just no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> don't hurry. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, Dan, can you push yours back? Green button. My green button. Okay. See if this. Uh, right, so so I'm actually right. So I'm gonna take over for for just this short part and give uh, give a little bit of uh, network terminology with with uh, Arun's version with with illustrations. So we're on the same page, and then we can come back to uh, to you. Is that okay? I'll sit down here too. You don't want to sit close to the camera. I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are fun. Go ahead, Tanya. So, so, so basically, what we did is we took the individuals and we made them nodes, which are the circles, and then we connected. Then they told us who they were connected to by who they stood near, and this is two body lengths away, which is really close. It's four meters, and this represents their associations. And this is not a weighted network; it's just zero or one. If they ever stood next to someone. We give them an edge. We connect them by a link, and if they never stood next to someone, then they don't get linked to that individual. Okay, take over, Tanya. Right. So can you switch? Okay. So, in so social networks in general is uh, mapping and measuring. Uh, relationships and interactions between individuals. So in our case, in this case, individuals are animals and interactions can be more okay. Yes? Would you mind moving the microphone? It's a little bit fuzzy. You're breaking up, Tanya. Okay. Is this better? You were good before, now we don't hear you at all. Really? I'll place it back here. Okay. Uh, I will place it. Whatever it is, it's happening. Can you hear me now? No, we don't hear you anymore. Why didn't you reply? Huh? Well, we don't hear. Tony, go sit back at your seat and just talk to your figures like I did, okay? Um. Okay. I know it's less boring and you can't gesticulate and you don't look at anybody and it's awful, but that's life. <laughs> Can you hear me now? No. 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 Can't hear you at all. What happened there? Shouldn't have moved it. You were great before. or links can be can represent proximity, aggression, grooming, or any other kind of relationship. And so I'll skip the history of social network analysis. 
But so we have uh, nodes, we call them nodes, individuals, um, and you have various kinds of relationships that can be represented as a link between those individuals. So it can be undirected, which um, is a symmetric relationship, so they're neighbors, so proximity networks are typically undirected. Association data is undirected. Or in uh, relationships which are asymmetric, such as groomer, grooming or aggression, is uh, the, the, the link, the edge is directed. So you have, uh, if, if the edge is from A to B, then the groom, the A is the groomer and B is the groomee. Or if it's an aggression relationship, then A is the dominant and B is the submissive. Um, well, not that, no, no, the A is the aggressor and B is the okay, receiver, because dominance is the outcome. Right, dominance, you can have dominance relationships, which is the consequence of a, aggression and maybe some other information. So, right, so it's the aggressor and, aggr and, and the receiver, or in dominance relationship, it would be dominant and submissive. So we can also have weight, which uh, in your case you said you don't, you have an unweighted network for Gravis, because it's only whether there was observed a relationship or not, so it's a binary. But you can have weights, how many times, uh, how often was the, this particular relationship observed. So, uh, there are several standard sort of quick things that you can, um, it's the measures that you can compute in a network, which are different than from just looking at the initial information uh, of, of per individual. So one global measure, which takes the entire, the entire structure of the network into consideration, is the notion of centrality, and various notions of centrality. Um, so the count started in the 1940s, Bavelis first proposed the idea of centrality in a network, and the basic idea is that the position of an individual, that an individual holds within uh, the, stru in the structure of the network is somehow correlated with the position of this individual in the society. It may be influence, importance, status, or um, just the, the, the sort of overall level of activity of that individual. So, because it's such a vague notion, what is the importance of an individual within a network, there are various notions of centrality that have been proposed that capture that, those various aspects of the, no of the notion of centrality. So the simplest one is degree centrality. Essentially, the more you, uh, the more you interact, the more, the more important you are somehow. So here's, uh, degree is the number of links an individual has. So in an undirected graph, which is network, which is what this is, is just the number of neighbors that an individual has. So for example, B there has four neighbors. Those are A, D, C, and E. And therefore, its degree is, two, is four. E has two neighbors, B and F, and its degree is uh, two. Right. So that's in a, that's just the uh, unweighted network where each edge is just was there yeah, a relationship? It's, un, it's undirected and unweighted. Right. You can add weights, and then you can have so how many times this particular relationship was observed, and then you can have weighted degree. So B now interacted once with A, D, and C, but twice with E, and so its weighted degree is five. E, even though it has only two neighbors, B and F but it interacted twice with B and 10 times with F, so its weighted degree is 12. So in terms of the level of activity, um, E has higher level of activity than B because it has higher weighted degree uh, than B, but B has more neighbors, so it's more diverse in its activity. Okay? So between the centrality is, um, is, is defined as how much in between, how much this particular individual is in between all other individuals, hence between us. So what does it mean? For intuitively, how many of the paths of the, between all the other individuals go through this one individual? So more precisely, it's the fraction of the shortest paths between all the other pairs of nodes that go through this individual. 
okay? So, and then intuitively our, is the higher between us, the more paths between all the other individuals go through this one, the, 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 the more of a bottleneck sort of this individual is for their, con for their relationships in the network as a whole. So here, in this example, E has, has very high between us because every path which, is between, which goes from an individual on the left and an individual on the right has to go through E. So very high fraction of all the paths between all individuals here have to go through E. Um, is, that, is that clear, guys? Would B and F have equally high in between this as E? No. So, um, good question. And uh, let me see. For direct between this here. No, because, they, because E has both F and B right. going through. Whereas exactly. F and B don't have the other going through. Right. Exactly. So E, in addition to, so B, B, E, and F have all the, pair, all the same pairs except, uh, going through them, except E also has the, anything that goes between B and the other component or from F and the other component, right? So, uh, so E has the highest between us. And intuitively also, why are those individuals important? Um, in the network because their removal uh, somehow, they're somehow between different communities, between different sort of cliques, between different groups in the network. And we'll talk, come back to the notion of community. And I just have one other sort of semantical question about this between this thing. Yeah. Would you include the paths that terminate in the node who's no. between this you're interested in calculating? No. So it's between pairs where neither of the node is the node itself. Ah, sure. Right? So the path has to go through that individual, but not terminate at it. So the exact definition uh, of betweenness and uh, uh, the exact mathematical definition is it's the fraction of the path, shortest path, in fact, in the network between pairs of nodes other than the node itself that, that go through the node. Questions here? Any, question, any other questions on your guys' side? Okay. So you can also compute edge between this. And, and again... Nothing, nothing changed. Not yet. I'm, I'm not changing. So, because I don't have a slide for edge between us. Since in, in addition to node between us, you can compute edge between us, how important... And the same, it's the same thing. How many... What's the fraction of the shortest path? between different nodes that go through that edge. How much of a, how important is that edge for maintaining the various connections between individuals in the, in the network? And again, intuitively, the higher the betweenness of a node, the more likely that, it's, that it is between, that it connects between disparate groups in the network, disparate insular groups in the network. Okay. So um, other measures. So these we were talking about uh, the uh, centrality measures, and and one actually which is missing here, which we will talk is uh, separately a little bit. There is a whole class of centrality measures, which are called spectral centrality or eigenvalue centrality. One example that every one of you, I'm absolutely sure, is familiar with is page rank. So that's the ranking that Google uses to, uh, to, 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 to rank the results of a search. So that's the rank that uh, is assigned to every web page out there. And the way it's computed, the w intuitively, all these eigenvalue spectral centrality of which page rank is one, uh, are that you are more important if other more important uh, nodes are pointing to you. And so 
That is a directed network centrality. We'll come back to it. Now, in addition to centrality, the parameter, the, the, what network gives us is information about density of the networks. How, how, how dense are the relationships within a certain group of individuals overall in the network, locally for an individual. So you can compute in general the density of the network. How many relationships are, are there versus how many could have been potentially. You can compute local density for, uh, for a group of nodes versus the entire network and that tells you does this group of nodes more tightly knit, more tightly connected than the entire network itself. You also, the, uh, there is a special no notion of local density, that's the clustering coefficient. So the clustering coefficient of a node is how many of, it, it measures how many of its friends are friends among themselves. So, looking at any given node, there is, uh, you, you can look at all its neighbors. Any two of its neighbors could be potentially connected, right? So, clustering coefficient, how clustered is the, na the, the network of this node, the local network of this node, we call it egocentric network of this node, is of all its neighbors that could have been connected, how many actually are? So, F has three neighbors, and if I turn to my side, how many possible pairs are there out of three? Three. Three, good. <laughs> so, of three neighbors, there could be potentially three connections, but only one exists between H and G. Therefore, the clustering coefficient of F is one third. And that tells you that the network of F, the local network of F, is not very uh, tightly knit. So, so if you think about your own friends, how many of your friends are friends among themselves? You know, that will tell you how, uh, how cohesive your, your, your own network of friendships is. Um, so for kicks, what is the clustering coefficient of H? Not too good. <laughs> the Princeton first. One. Great. Uh, what is the clustering this side? What's the clustering coefficient of E? Zero. Zero, right? So the more part of a, a sort of insular, tightly knit group you are, the higher typically your clustering coefficient is going to be. Um, if your friends, none of your friends know each other, you're not member, probably not member of any community, not a member of any group. The way I like to think of it, Tanya, is E is right here at my joint, let's say. Mm -hmm. E is two friends, F and B. Mm -hmm. But they're not friends with each other. So when V's become triangles, right. you start to form a clique because they become friends with each other. And, and what's critical is that redundancy allows me to be taken out of the picture and they can still be connected. They don't have to indirectly connect for me. And so cluster coefficients are often called the degree of cliquishness because they form cliques with redundancy. Right. Yeah. And in some way, it's complementary to betweenness. So the higher your betweenness, the lower your clustering coefficient. It's less important. Right. Only yeah. so, so they're very, they're, they're flip sides of the same coin, complementary, but they tell you very important factors about potential function of the structure that you see. Right. So Dan, can we now switch back to uh, your, yeah, your okay. slides? Uh, do I have to do something? Just press the green button. My, is my green button? Yeah. I did. Nothing's happened yet. I guess it takes time. Is your computer awake? Uh, I don't know about that. My computer's asleep. My computer's asleep? Okay. Okay, something happened. Cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll get it back. Hold on, something went wrong. Let's see. 
Mm -hmm. My computer fell asleep. Um, Here on this slide, I'll go to the board for my guys. It's kind of small. Can we make this bigger? Is this possible? Can yeah, this like bigger than Tanya? <laughs> well, yeah. All right. So we looked at the number of connected components. So this is the Grevy zebra and the onager. Oh, right. And by inspection, you can see three connected components in Grevy zebra. One big cluster here, a solitary male here, and a group of four over here. Notice that group of four, everybody's connected to everybody else, so the cluster coefficient is one for that one, for that one subgroup. If you look at the Grevy zebra, you can see which individuals have odd between this. I can't read the numbers, but they're the two individuals that are on the edge of this really because they're the ones Dan? Okay. We're Dan, we're Hi. losing you. Oh, I'm far away. Okay, so now it's my. Problem. Okay, no, no. okay. Now we're now right. we're good. <laughs> it's hard for me to, to point to the to the graph. That's the problem. Uh, uh, anyway, so we number ten components. Vertex no. degree. Uh, the okay, there we go. Yeah, you can use oh, the the cool. pointer point. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, oh, I lost it. Just move it. It will be. It will come back. <laughs> So this, this, this little subgroup here is its own connected component, and notice it's totally cliquish. The cluster coefficient is 1. The second component is here, the solitary individual, and the other big component is all of this stuff here. You can see which individuals have high between this, this individual and this individual, because they connect everything from this outer set of structures, the big group over here. You go to the onagers, there's only two connected components, the solitary male here and everybody else. And you can see the degree of tightness in terms of who's connected to whom is more diffuse in the onagers than it is in the very zebra. So vertex degree we can look at, we can compute the average. We can look at centrality, the, the eigenvectors, which is a global metric, as, as um, Tanya was talking about, not just the direct number of connections to an individual, but the connections of who's connected and how important they are in terms of the number of connections. Then there was the cluster coefficient path length, which is the number of edges delineating the shortest path connecting any two nodes. Tanya was alluding to that. And between this is the number of shortest paths going through a particular node, so these guys connect all of these guys. So the shortest paths, whatever they are, like from this guy to this guy, have to follow through this guy here, if that's the shortest path, or this guy here, if that's the shortest path. Using these aggregated averages or from static networks, we can just compute these three, and some of them are statistically significant, and hence presumably biologically significant. Number of connected components was the three versus two, but the path, average path length was 1.9 versus 1.6, and the cluster coefficient on this zero one network was almost everybody was connected. The high cliqueishness in the Grevy zebra and less cliqueishness in the in the onagers. Okay, so those are the static networks that we were talking about. Tanya, I think we probably should defer until next time. Right, I was going to say, yeah. Move, moving on to the. Uh, to the, to the uh, dynamic network. But I just want to end with just some interesting things on plain zebras, which I don't think you've seen. I don't know if you've seen this, Tanya. So this is, we know male yeah. change status. They go from bats to males to stallions. And we, we know because of their stripes when they change status. So we can look at long before they change, just before they change, just after they change, and long after they change. So we can identify individuals by, by stripes, we can divide the networks in four month long intervals, and we can divide them into, we can take the network metrics we talked about for four month intervals, we can divide them into monthly intervals to see what's going on. And what's interesting is that you can look at that guy in the red dot there, which is male 2001.722, 
This is his 30-day window, his number of connections, who he's connected with, between 60 days and 30 days before we know he changed from a stallion to a bachelor male. And you can see him right in the center with a zillion lines running through him. His, his degree is like whopping high. 30 days before he makes the change from stallion to bachelor male, look at him. He's only got degree two. He's only got two, two associates that he, that he stands next to. After he makes the switch, he again is pretty peripheral. He has a lot of links going through him, but nowhere near as many as he had before in the 30 days after he made the switch from stallion to non-breeder. And then 30 to 60 days later, he's back highly connected with very high degree. If we don't use him as an individual, but we look at the average, and in this case we're using the association index, so we're looking at it almost, this is almost like weighted degree. Mm -hmm. um, stallion to batch the male, 60 days before, high, let's say weighted degree, it drops 30 days before, 30 days after, and then it goes back up at 60 days after, from stallion to bachelor. And surprisingly, it's exactly the same as Baxter the Stallion. So again, they're changing their associates, and they're changing the number of connections that they have. And so time matters. And everything we did in the, in the previous analysis was aggregating four months worth of data, the entire dry season or the entire wet season. And yet, when you actually start to look at smaller chunks, you can start to see that time matters. And that's what spurred Tanya and I in our groups to start to look at dynamic networks. How can we describe, for example, components, connected components, as communities as they change over time? Who they're connected with. And that's what we'll pick up with, Tanya, the next time we meet, which will be next Wednesday, okay?